Hey, you clicked on my video. Appreciate it. Now be sure to like the video and subscribe to the page. Long enough to cover the subject and short enough to keep it interesting. Welcome to Out Up My League. I'm Nick Diaz. When you hear anything about a bye week, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Health! Getting healthy. Get off your feet and get healthy. Get everybody uh, as quick to recovery as possible. You need it. The second thing you probably think is, well, you get extra time to prepare for the next opponent. In this case, Alabama. You got two full weeks to prepare and scout Alabama, practice for Alabama, and get healthy in the process. While all of that is true, I would argue that that's not even the most important part of the bye week. To me, the most important part of the bye week is self-scouting. See, what people don't realize is that you don't really get that much time during the season to fix yourself. You watch the mistakes you made against the previous team on Sunday, but the rest of Sunday is already moving on to the next team. And then most teams only spend maybe half of their Monday practice through walkthroughs fixing the problems from last week. Why doesn't it take so long to fix this problem, Nick? Why are they taking so long to figure out this or that? Well, because you only have so much time to fix it in season. You know, it's like uh, trying to fix an engine while you're driving it down the highway. It's very difficult. I contend that actually it's harder to fix problems in college football than it is in the NFL. Because, one, you're dealing with 19-year-olds, so that's hard enough to begin with. But secondly, you only have 20 hours a week with them. They're not full-time football players the entire time, even though they're there to play football. Bye weeks are more important in college football than they are in the NFL. Because think about it, if a player is hurt, they'll take the week off not really practicing much. Um, You know, your analysts, the hundreds of analysts you have in a program, they've already scouted every single team multiple times over way ahead of you because that's their job. But self-scouting and practicing on yourself and your problems, that's different. You don't get to do that a lot. So, here's what we're going to do today. We're going to take the time to find out how do you beat LSU. We're the LSU coaches, we're Brian Kelly, we're Mike Denbrock, we're Matt House, we're Brian Polian, and we are going to self-scout ourselves and try to figure out what's wrong with us. If you were uh, the other team, how would you beat us? So, I'm Brian Kelly, and I walk into the office with offensive coordinator Mike Denbrock, and I have the task to game plan against LSU's defense and try to beat them. So I ask Mike Denbrock, well, where is LSU's biggest weakness on defense? Well, other than the Tennessee game... They've been very good at stopping the run. But, here's the thing. They don't have a lot of depth on their defensive line. Makai Wingo has been phenomenal in replacing Mason uh, Smith. B.J. Ojolari is a pass rush specialist. A defensive end, Ali Gay, has struggled a bit, but he played better against Ole Miss. And Jaqueline Roy and Jacoby Gil- Guillory clog up the middle. Outside of that... That's pretty much it. They don't really have too much uh, out there, especially in the interior of their defensive line. That's all they got. And the one thing that I saw Ole Miss and Tennessee do to move the ball on the ground is go tempo. A lot. We need to get LSU's interior defensive line tired and make them scramble to the line because every time I've seen them scramble to the line of scrimmage in uh, up-tempo situations, they are slow to get down and get in position. Every time. And also, I'd run it off tackle against B.J. Ojolari and against a struggling Ali Gay because the stats show that LSU is weak on off-tackle defense. They also don't have a lot of depth at linebacker. Make them use it. Now look, Michael Baskerville is a sure-handed tackler and he's going to be an NFL draft pick. Greg Penn is also a sure-handed tackler, but he's not as athletic. He's just sort of a thumper in the middle. He does his job and he does it well enough. But their backups at linebacker, they're either true freshmen or they're just average special teamers. That's about it. Oh, what about Harold Perkins? Aha! Here's my solution to stop Harold Perkins. See, Harold Perkins is great, but he can only really do one or two things. That's rush the passer or spy the quarterback, especially at that outside linebacker position. That's it. That's really all he can do right now as a freshman. He can do it better than maybe anybody, but that's just about it. So... The only way for him to be on the field is to take their first round draft pick, B.J. Ojolari, off the field. That's the dilemma that LSU's having. So, every time Harold Perkins is on the field, 
he's going to be playing that outside Jack linebacker spot against an offensive tackle. An offensive tackle that outweighs him by over 100 pounds. So what I would do is every time he's playing outside linebacker, I would run it to his side of the field and have our tackle key in on him. That's a weak spot in the run game. He's pretty good. He's pretty athletic. He may make a play, but I'll take the 100 pounds of physics against them. And if we get in third and long against LSU, if we get in third and long, go no huddle. I don't care if it's third and 15. I don't care if it's third and eight. Go no huddle. Just get it in your mind right now. Go no huddle. Because when we do that, we are not allowing Matt House and their defense to substitute B.J. Ojolari or Harold Perkins back into the game for their cheetah package. Keep just one of them on the game. You know, they're not going to take B.J. Ojolari off the field and Harold Perkins off the field at the same time. One of them is going to bound to be on the field at one point. We don't want both of them, especially in third and long pass rush. That's their specialty. Go no huddle on third and long. That's what we do. All right, well, how do we attack LSU's defensive backs? Well, LSU's defensive backs, they all have one thing in common. One thing. They are physical, and they tackle well in space, especially Safety Jay Ward and Greg Brooks. Those dudes love to hit people. But their corners, Makai Garner and Jarek Bernard Converse, very big. Uh, they love to hit, um, oversized, but they keep them in soft coverage a lot. And they do that because those two corners, and really all of their corners, can't run in space downfield with elite to pretty good wide receivers in the SEC. So, if we can find a way to get them out of their soft coverage, we will torch them in the passing game, especially running downfield. Get these corners running downfield, get them to flip their hips, and we have a chance. They are physical, but they are just okay in coverage. Now, let's walk over to the special teams. All right, what are they good at? Nothing. No, I'm just kidding. They can kick and punt really well, but other than that, they've been pretty below average, even though they were better against Ole Miss. They've been pretty pretty below average. I'd say just wait for them to make a mistake. That's about it. Moving on to LSU's defensive room with Matt House. So, Brian Kelly walks into Matt House's office, and he says, All right, you're game planning for our offense. How would you stop LSU's offense, Matt House? Well, Coach... There aren't a lot of things that they don't do well, really. They do a lot of things really well, especially the last two games. But if I had to find one thing to stop, one thing, it's the read option with Jaden Daniels. See, when LSU runs the ball well, the rest of their offense goes well as well. So that was a lot of wells. Even when they struggled against Florida State, even when they struggled against Auburn, the times that their offense got moving was when they were running the ball. And the read option adds another layer to that. Because one, not only are you running the ball, but it takes another defender out of the box to spy on the quarterback. And number two, once you do those things, it helps open up the passing game for Jaden Daniels and these wide receivers and tight ends. Also, it adds another dimension with the RPO. It allows space for the wide receivers to run downfield, and it allows for tight end Mason Taylor to get loose on those RPOs, especially in the flats. He's broken a few of them. It's the domino effect. The read option is the domino effect that helps the rest of LSU's offense go. If you take away that, it'll have a negative domino effect on the rest of their offense. They may still score. They may still move the ball. They may still have explosive plays because they have a lot of talent, especially at receiver, but that will make them uncomfortable. See, before Jaden Daniels, before he wasn't throwing the ball and actually giving these wide receivers a chance, part of his comfort zone also came from the running game. Okay, So if we can get Jaden Daniels to stop running these read options with the running backs and force him to do what, what he did against Tennessee, which is throw the ball 40 times a, a game, then that makes him one-dimensional, which in turn does something that not everybody else is really talking about at this moment, which is the fact that, sure, LSU's offense has been playing great and really awesome and historically great, actually, but there's one thing. Florida and Ole Miss, their defense kind of sucks. Matter of fact, they're just horrible, and they can't tackle at all. They are horrible at tackling. So LSU has done what a good offense should do against bad defenses. They've taken care of their business and dominated that defense like a good offense should do, specifically a bad tackling team, 
with bad defensive lines, which bad defensive lines can't stop the run. So that has not only helped LSU's run game, but it's taken pressure off of these two freshman tackles in passing situations, especially right tackle Emory Jones, who has gotten beat up a few times, matter of fact, several times against the pass rush, against Auburn, against Tennessee, against Florida's best pass rusher. So we don't know for a fact that Emory Jones is ready for Alabama's defensive line. We don't know for a fact if he's ready for Arkansas's defensive line, A&M's defensive line, which has a lot of salty players on them. We don't know yet. So if I were to stop LSU's offense, you key in on that read option, and that forces LSU to get out of third and manageable or third and short, and it makes them work more from third and seven to third and long more and more and more. And when that's in a passing situation attack those freshman tackles in the pass rush and make Jaden Daniels try and win the game and air it out as much as possibly can. That's what I would do. So, now that we've self-scouted LSU, how does LSU counteract that self-scouting report? How do they do that? So, another team uh, is going to scout LSU, and LSU probably knows what their weaknesses are, so they're figuring, okay, well, Alabama or Arkansas can see that. Surely they can. How do we counteract? How do we counteract that self-scouting report? How do we catch them off guard? Well, they don't pay me the big bucks. But I do have a guest coming on tomorrow. He may be able to answer those questions for you. Thanks for listening to Out of My League. If you like what you heard, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Or follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok in the description link below.